Okay, nice. So yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for being so much here. So I'm I'm gonna do a, a presentation a bit in in two parts. In the first, I'm gonna introduce the Oli Lab for those of you that don't know, and introduce also a bit my my colleagues and maybe you you will find some uh, interesting research also for yourselves and then I, I will speak about a bit the research i've been doing for the last three years in my phd which is how can we use machine learning techniques to perform farm wide uh, fatigue damage estimations uh, yeah okay so uh this is very slow <laughs> Um, I can also link it to the Ethernet if you have. No, it's, I think it's okay, but it was just again a bit of yeah. time to change the slide. But so, yeah, just uh, going back, I'm indeed going to speak first about the research in our lab and then about my own research. This is a, a nice uh, figure, a picture I, I took here in Switzerland, actually, uh, not too far away from uh, Interlaken. And so it's a nice way to introduce our group. It's a group that started already more than 10 years ago, uh, 11 years ago now. And it started with my promoter and one of the professors, so Christoph de Print. And at the time, he did uh, the first monitoring installations in, in wind farms in, in Belgium. Um, and it was still very a very simple setup. But right now, this includes not only our university, so the Vera Universiteit Brussel, but also Universiteit Ghent and Ceres, which is not a university, but a research institute of the Belgian government. And they also work a bit with uh, with wind energy. Oh, and by the way, Ovilad, it's the on and offshore wind infrastructure application lab. And so in my university, we have quite a lot of people that are working just for SHM and wind energy. So, you know, one ICT support, one industrial PhD that just started, eight PhDs, three postdocs, and two professors. So, Christoph and, and Walt. And not to toot my own horn too much, but we are sitting in possibly the largest real world monitoring data of uh, wind turbines, offshore wind turbines, that is academically available. So, we have very good contact with the companies in Belgium. And we're currently monitoring all of the offshore wind farms in, in Belgium. And I mean, this is not only SCADA, but it goes very concretely to nine monopiles and two jacket foundations that are uh, installed with strain gauges. And we also have IOTs, so accelerometers, that are now installed in, a, in an entire farm. So we're, um, and this is very recent, it's been installed in the last couple of months. And so I wanted to present a bit of the research we do. So in this case, I'll present a bit of the projects that we're working on right now in a very superficial way. So the first one I'd like to show is Saltwin. And this project takes a look into the design documentation. And there's a mismatch between the monitoring we're doing and the design documentation, be it in the eigenfrequencies or uh, or whatever. And so we built a meta database, or um, the group has built a, a meta database with geotechnical and geometrical information. And you can see, for example, for a given farm, you have the monopiles, but you also have, have the seabed depth. And this will then go also into first modes, uh, eigenfrequencies, uh, and so on. And we have the supersized research, of which I'm a bit more uh, close to. And right now we're already in a, a quite far stage in which we are talking about certifying our process. So we want to do this fleet-wide fatigue monitoring, and we've been able to do this with accelerometers, so IOTs, and we have quite okay results. And now we're talking with DNV to get this certified. And it's a process that's going to take quite a number of years, but we are now already starting in the talks and first sort of find the monitoring part, so the strain gauges and then our machine learning approach. We also have Max Wind, which takes a look at um, older um, offshore wind farms. 
And it's also taking a look a bit into the probabilistic framework of fatigue lifetime estimation. We then have uh, BOPTIC, um, which is a project that's trying to leverage the use of uh, FPGs and other uh, fiber um, um, sensors. And these are mostly installed um, on the monopile, along the monopile. But we also have some context with Marlinks, which is a Belgian company that is doing um, this in terms of the, the actual cables. So it's a wider project. And then we have two SHM projects, which aren't wind related, but um, we also apply our techniques. One is on uh, damage detection in high voltage towers. So see if some bolts have been taken out and if we can identify this. But most importantly, they want us, and this has already been done, they want to see if we could identify people climbing up these high voltage towers, because a lot of times, some people climb and they steal some copper or, or whatever. So the companies are interested to, to know if, if these events are occurring and when they are occurring. And then also a quite recent project we have, um, which is a Interreg, a Northwest Europe project. So also with partners from Stuttgart and, um, and somewhere in the Netherlands. It's um, from a bridge in Almeda. So in, in the Netherlands, and they built it with a novel material. And again, they want event detection and, and damage because um, sometimes cars drive by and they're not supposed to do. So they won't be able to, to detect when, uh, when this has happened. So this is a bit the projects we have. I would also like a bit to introduce you guys to, to my colleagues. So a bit of a research tinder. Don't take it too seriously. <laughs> But um, just, I'll, I'll go very superficially. If you guys find something interesting, you can take a picture or, or I'll share the presentation with you. And there's also the context of my colleagues. So maybe it's it's something that, uh, that you find interesting. So uh, the first colleague is Bruno Stout and he works with the Geotech team. And he's working mostly on, again, this sort of um, updating of soil structure interaction uh, models based on the monitoring data. So there's this mismatch between design and what we're actually monitoring, and he's doing this, um, this updating. Then um, Carlos also works a bit with the geotech, but more from a finite element side. And he uses mostly Bayesian model updating to, uh, to get better uh, models. Then we have a multiple match, so uh, many people on this one, and it's the fatigue office. And what they do is essentially take a look at more, and more at the theoretical side and how can we, you know, cycle count correctly and uh, these sorts of things. And the people involved with this are um, Negin and Kuhn, so PhD candidates, and Ilfa and Pietro, which are now postdocs. And I will also, just like to quickly focus on Pietro because last week he just uh, published Pi Fatigue, which you can now um, access on GitHub. And it's um, a very nice package or module which is implementing uh, cycle counting based on, on rational counting. And you have the capability of taking a look at different fatigue and uh, crack propagation analysis and crack geometries. So he did a very good job, and this is very recent research. So if you guys are interested, do take a look. And then I have two colleagues that work with me a bit more in machine learning. So Maxwell works on uh, novelty detection on SHM data, and he worked mostly with uh, the automated tracking of modal parameters. So he worked a lot with uh, autoencoders, um, but also XJ Boost and other types of architectures. And then uh, Yassin Bahaj, he um, also uh, works in somewhat similar research, but mostly on structural vibration-based anomaly detection. And he's trying to make this um, agnostic to, to the structure. And he also has a, a background in operational model analysis. So we're trying to combine a bit of the OMA and, uh, and machine learning with, uh, with Yassine and also a bit with Max. So that was um, a bit our group and 
Um, as I said, we have a very large uh, data set. We don't have enough, have enough people to analyze. So if you guys have some nice models that you want to try, test out in a real world data set to contact us, I mean, we're always open for a, for a collaboration. So yeah, and then um, as for my research, it's uh, the last years have been about how can we use machine learning to estimate fatigue in, uh, in an offshore wind farm. And in this case, what we want to do is we want to have a good picture about the fatigue life of every turbine located within a farm. And this is important because we know that operation and maintenance is about one third of the costs for, um, for wind farm operators. And because we're now collecting these huge amount of data, machine learning sort of came as the best solution to, to make this analysis. So in the specific case of um, offshore wind turbines, when we're talking about the fatigue life, we have, of course, a, a fatigue limit upon which our um, our design life is uh, is going to hinge upon and so we know that throughout the um, the offshore wind turbines uh, lifetime there's going to be a series of events that are going to impact the the fatigue damage that it um, accrues so we start off with the power driving so once it's installed this is of course going to going to have an impact on fatigue then when there's just a foundation, and then once the operational and, um, and environmental conditions kick in, the turbine is operating, we have rotor stops and rotor starts, we have a lot of loads, both structural, but also hydrodynamic and aerodynamic. And so this is gonna make our fatigue damage increase progressively up until we reach the design life. Now, this is based on the design documentation, and we know that this is sometimes a very good approximation, but not uh, corresponding to the exact truth of what is happening. So our idea is, of course, to monitor what is happening with the structure. And we hope that once we start monitoring, we can see that we still have a, a big reserve until uh, our current day. And in the end of the design life, we would hope that our um, structural reserve would be very, very limited. But if we see a sufficient, a sufficient mismatch between the design documentation and our monitoring, then what we can do is um, a fatigue rate extrapolation. And this can open the door for us to actually change the end of life. And this would make us then get a lot of monetary gain. So if, if we can prolong the, the lifetime of the wind turbines, this is for operators very, very interesting. So yeah, and then there's money. So what, um, what we do in uh, most of our turbines is we of course have access to SCADA data, but we, we also install accelerometers and strain gauges. And the idea behind the accelerometers and strain gauges is that strain gauges are amazing if you want to perform load monitoring. But in the specific case of offshore wind, because the maintenance is so costly, especially because you need to train people and you need to send them on the boat, operators are just not interested in having strain gauges for 20 or 25 years or, or whatever. And that means that we need to find more um, cost-effective solutions and our idea is exactly to, to replace this with acceleration and, and SCADA data. So train a model on this data based on the ground truth from the strain gauges and then apply it for more. So this is where our fleet leader concept comes from. So we cannot, of course, install strain gauges throughout the entire farm. This is far too costly. So we can only have a couple to three turbines that have strain gauges for which we have the ground truth for our models. But then we train our models in one of these uh, turbines, the so-called fleet leader, and then we can uh, cross-validate in, uh, in another turbine, and then we can make the, the farm-wide predictions. And of course, this then can get more complex because we don't need to train on just one turbine. We can think of it as a population, but uh, in a nutshell, this is what we do. And so 
our first approach and Constantinos is here now, if I remember correctly, you work with Ninfa on something like this. So the idea was the way we were going at it first was we were trying to reconstruct a trust log and correct me if I'm wrong, but then you wanted to get the I order dynamics from the accelerometer and then with the common filter sort of get the reconstructed signal in a very simple way. The reconstruction of the input, uh, yeah. which is considered unknown, yeah. but applied in that case to the top uh, of the yeah, NACAN. Yes. Yeah. So it's a construction of a time uh, series. Yeah. You may be showing something similar there. Yeah, exactly. So this was where I picked up from the work of Nifa. She had just finished her PhD. And again, with one second scale, and we were working with jackets. So it was mostly on the four aft direction. We weren't quickly taking a look at side to side. But something we notice is okay, we can reconstruct the trust load quite well. Not even to mention the problem that I think you guys had with the common filter to actually merge the, the signals. But okay, once you cycle count this signal, because you have the the ruler exponent from the SM curve, your errors are gonna explode, right? Like even if you have a, a small error on the on the load reconstruction, once you go to a damage equivalent load, this is gonna increase too because much. it's human. Yeah, exactly. So what uh, what did we did? Okay, let's just calculate directly Dell and not even care about reconstructing the the signal. And yeah, we can then argue about how correct this is. But um, so our approach again using jackets, um, we compared two different instrumentation setups. One was very poor quality, so ten minutes SCADA and low quality accelerations that you can find in the nacelle usually and not always but, but some you do have them and then we had one of our uh, instrumentation setup so we had one second scatter we were still using the thrust load and we had our shm uh, accelerometers and then we process these into 10 minute metrics and then we train our model again as um Gosses was saying we want to get the tower transition piece interface loads. And then we can calculate the damages on a 10 minute level. It's a bit slow. And then we can accumulate and rescale these uh, using an LP norm essentially, and we can get uh, a long term damage equivalent load or damage equivalent moment. And so for a time series reconstruction, this approach works quite well, especially if you have the better um, SHM um, data set, because of course, um, these accelerometers are uh, much uh, higher quality than the regular ones. So you can capture uh, complex behavior like rotor stops, for example, which induce a lot of uh, fatigue damage. So. But I mean, both models captured uh, the, the baseline behavior, but of course, SHM is, is much better. And then once we started accumulating the DELs, we see that we actually have a quite good agreement. Um, still some, some difference between our, um, our ground truth, so in blue, and then our models in, in green and, and orange. But something we, we saw is that our um, our long term DEL or the fatigue rate is going to start converging after a couple of months, and this is also something that was seen for um, I mean, especially in the era we we can see this like after about six months you you get into a constant, and this was something that was seen by the group of uh, Clement Suvla and Anova that after about this time so six nine months you sort of start converging into a, va uh, a value. And what this means is that we can uh, then think of this um, extrapolation um, um, of the fatigue rate. But so this was the T initial research, and then we shifted to monopiles. And monopiles are a bit different from jackets because, well, they are 
right now with X, XL monopiles or XXL monopiles, they have eight meters of diameter. So their dynamics are just completely different. And a lot of the industry was using this uh, soft stiff approach. So it was putting the eigenfrequencies between the 1P and the 3P. And I mean, you can see this, this is already a quite old graph, but you can see how it's been getting cl progressively closer to the wave's um, frequency. And what this means is, especially for these very big monopiles, which have a very big area, they just get very much prone to wave-induced fatigue. And once we took a look at the actual uh, readings, of course, like these are almost 10 megawatt turbines, so the magnitude of the damage is, is much bigger, but also the profile of the damage is, is quite different. And if you compare with jackets or standard monopiles, there are two, two things that completely change. On the one hand, side to side becomes more important than for aft in, um, in nominal uh, functioning. And this is because in for aft you still have a bit that aerodynamic damping from the rotor working and in side to side you don't have this. So just getting the waves there. And then of course, once this aerodynamic uh, damping goes off, idling becomes much more important than a nominal uh, functioning. So we made this shift to the monopiles and because of the data set we had, we could no longer work with one second SCADA. So we needed to work with 10 minute SCADA, again with accelerometers and strain gauges. And we also tried to include wave data, but from a Flemish um, database, which is quite, um, you know, it's not too, uh, too accurate. It just gives you a reading for the North Sea. And here we also then tried to go for a physics SCADA neural um, network model. And this was because we were working essentially with two different time scales. Like we need to make the predictions at a 10 minute level because this is how SCADA is being processed and, and we get it. But of course, damage, we, we don't want it just for 10 minutes. So we want this for a longer period. And we don't want to say, I want this always for one year or for two years. We want to be flexible in this. And so we just, um, adapted a bit our um, our loss function to include the, the ruler exponent um, into it and also the, um, the LP norm that we use to, to accumulate damages on the long term. And this really made an, an improvement and um, not too much on, on the 10 minute level predictions. It stayed pretty much the same, but once we accumulate them, we have almost a tenfold increase in the performance, which was very nice to see. And especially then, once we start taking a look at different time scales, we can see how, of course, positive and negative errors are going to cancel each other out. So we're going to start converging to to a value. And again, uh, and again, this is important for um, for uh, extrapolations if uh, we want to do them in the future. And then we took the extra step of going from damage equivalent loads to an actual fatigue damage. It's quite small here, but it's the, the small equation over there. You can see that the damage equivalent loads, they are to the exponent of the, uh, the, um, the inverse of the slope of the SN curve, so the volume exponent. And again, this means that errors are just going to increase a lot. But still, we compare them with the, um, the design documentation errors, which um, they find acceptable. And we're well within the bounds. And again, this convergence after six months is we keep on, on seeing this. So as long as we can get winter and summer periods, we are sort of safe in terms of, uh, of extrapolating this into the future. And this is important then for in the beginning, I was talking about the project where we want to cert certify this. So it's important to, to show that this will, um, this will be somewhat stable. Something to take care of this issue, though, is a work we did together with uh, Nandar Lang from uh, the University of Liège. And we took a look at how can we use Bayesian neural networks to, I mean, of course, we can, we can get this distribution. But the most interesting thing for us is the uncertainty that is quantified by the model. Because say that you 
we are still restricted in the data we have. So we have a fleet leader. So you train your model in this fleet leader and you want to apply it farm-wide. Well, with the, the Bayesian neural network, even without ground truths, because of the coefficient of variation, we're going to be able to identify outliers within the fleet. But also something very interesting is strain gauges, uh, let's say that we have two years where we can collect data and then they need maintenance, but it's too costly, so we're not going to do this again. Well, we train our model, and once we see the coefficient of variation uh, increasing within the, the same turbine, then we know that something is changing in its dynamics. And this can be scour, so when, uh, when there's erosion around the monopile of the turbine. And this is, for us, very useful just to have a feeling of how uh, well our models adapting. So this has been a bit my my research until now, and now a bit on um, the work I've been doing here with uh, Imad and uh, and Greg on uh, using graph neural networks for uh, for wind farms. And again, what we want to do is we no longer think of this as having a fleet leader instrument or something. We just want to take a look at the farm as uh, a graph and then make predictions for for the entire graph based on some global variables so we as a day said we use some simulations from biowick which is a flow solver developed by the dtu this is why they are also um, also here and we had some very clear objectives so based on uh, a global far field wind vector so we we know the wind speed the wind direction and the turbulence intensity we want to estimate locally so for every turbine within a farm what it's going to be its power its uh, wind speed turbulence intensity and the loads that it's going to be facing and then we wanted to compare different message passing layers if you know a bit of uh, gnns then um, you'll know gen gen and get and then also we wanted to compare a different uh, connectivity scheme. So how can we connect the different turbines to one another? So through the Lonnie triangulation, K nearest neighbors or a radial scheme. And so just to show you uh, some, some quick examples of uh, what were we doing. In this case, um, we're testing how good can we actually extrapolate with these graphs. So we train on a three by three graph with the Lonnie, um connectivity and then we're going to try and predict on a five by five graph and can we see if the the model adapts sufficiently well and the answer is of course there are um, some uh, some points where we are missing but overall the results are quite um, quite encouraging i mean power uh, wind speed and even turbulence intensity prediction is quite trivial once we get to uh, the damage equivalent loads, this is more difficult. But still, this uh, for this particular turbine, so number twelve, it's under wake, and we can still get quite uh, quite well at least the mean um, damage profile. And something that we also did um, was not only take a look at these small um, subgraphs or small layouts, but we also generated random layouts. So you input a, a certain number of turbines, then based on several geometrical forms, which have different angles and orientations, you select one of them and you generate a graph. So we generated 50 of these graphs and we're still working on, on getting this working perfectly in terms of the actual training, but still we can, um, we can get pretty good results for unseen layouts. So in terms of a, a turbine which is under one would expect considerable considerable wake and here we have to take this with a pinch of salt because pi wake the way it models loads it's pretty much just one turbine on another it's uh, not too fancy but so we're we're able to capture most of the most of the behavior also for the difficult uh damage equivalent loads and so this has been a bit what we've been doing and what we want to present in a conference but um i had some ideas for what we can do specifically in um 
in wind energy with uh, graph neural networks or with the uh, data sets that we have in, in Belgium. And the cool thing about graph neural networks is that they actually extrapolate quite well, much better than regular neural networks. And something, for example, in um, SHM in wind energy that we can think of as virtual sensing. So when we have um, a sensor installed at a certain location and we want to go to another location, for example, mud line or uh, uh, even deeper. And here um, I talked about Bobtick, a project where we actually have um, a turbine monopile which has uh, fiber break grading sensors installed along the monopile. I think at every 50 centimeters. And again, we can um, we can discretize this into uh, into a graph, and we can try to make uh, predictions for, for example, emitting one of the sensors in the middle, and see if our graph is still able to to predict for this. And this becomes then even more interesting once we start start to take a look at uh, concrete geometries, for example, for jackets. Um, these these loads are very much geometrically dependent, so it might be interesting to, to apply uh, graph neural networks. Something that we can also do is, again, we, we have our farm with the graph. Would we be able to train a subgraph within the farm? So train, train it in the, in the turbines which we have instrumented and then adapt for the entire farm. And something which can be independent from this is, can we actually use graph neural networks to run scenarios? So say for example, curtailment, once the grid operator says, we are producing too much wind, wind energy. So your part needs to reduce the, your power output. And in that case, the, the wind farm operator will most likely have to, before they used to shut, down, shut out uh, turbines, right now what they do is they reduce the power that they produce but it would be interesting to know which turbines should it shut down based on the demands from the electrical operator in terms of how can i spare my my turbines in terms of fatigue which will be the most impacted and so with uh, graph neural networks it would be interesting to if we have this up and running very quickly run some simulations about different possibilities and, and see how this would affect the overall loads in the farm. And finally, we can um, we can think, think of the fatigue case tables that uh, we usually have for a uh, specific uh, farms, and these are dependent on um, environmental conditions. And we can try, try and translate them with uh, graph neural networks and then see if these adapt well into a new layout if we can uh, use this. But also uh, one of the big things is if we just want a quick surrogate. So, so you have some high fidelity um, area elastic simulations and you run a bunch of scenarios. You train a, a, a GNN based on this data set and then you try and apply this to different layouts different scenarios that uh, you want to run and then perform optimization on, uh, on this. So that's a bit uh, the idea that we might have for uh, uh, GNNs in, uh, in wind energy. But yeah, let's, uh, let's see how, the, how we go in the future with uh, this work. That was my presentation. Thank you very much.